Yes, please, Kathy. Oh, sorry, Brian. Right? Moving into your space. I my daughter not left my car with no petrol in it. <laughs> <laughs> what the kids will do. Thank you. All right, it's 10 o'clock, so welcome everybody to the general committee meeting. I declare the meeting open. Um, for those in the gallery and those watching at home, any motions passed today only have the status of recommendations to be forwarded to the ordinary uh, meeting on Thursday evening, where they'll be ratified as decisions of the local government. Uh, we have no apologies. Do we have any presentations or deputations? No, not yet. And welcome back, Mr. CEO. I to say thank you to you. And uh, tomorrow is um, Councillor Stockwell's birthday, so with no further ado, please join me in a singing him happy, happy Birthday. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear Brian. Happy Birthday to you. <laughs> now that every now that everybody's turned off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now we had a large agenda today because all the items from the Planning and Environment Committee and the items from the Services and Organisation Committee have been referred here due to those meetings being cancelled thanks to the bushfires in our Perigian. Um, so the first item on the agenda is the update to infrastructure charges resolution and welcome Kim, Kerry and Lloyd. Councillors, do you have any questions for the staff? I'll move it. I'll second it. Moved Councillor Larkin, seconded Councillor Glasgow. Now, Lutz, regarded as one of the foremost experts in Queensland on this arcane and very hard to understand topic, so we have full confidence in your report. <laughs> you speaking to the no, motion, no, Mr. Sorry. Chair? Forgive <laughs> me. Sorry, Mr. Wellington. Councillor Wellington, you're no, I just, um, as you were saying, um, thanks very much, Lord. Great job. Well done. <coughs> Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Oh, yeah, I will. Councillor Pardon? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, look, in the report, <clears throat> I understand uh, the charges have overall gone up only a couple of percent and thus basically representing uh, inflation. Uh, the point I'd make is with regards to Lud, um, you, you need a special brain to work out these charges as far as I'm concerned. And Lud's been doing it for, I don't know how many years. Must 2001. Be 2001, almost 20 years. He had hair before he started. <laughs> yeah. And uh, if you look at, um, I guess if he was getting it wrong, uh, we would have uh, a lot of challenges. And when you get to page uh, 11 in the report, in the uh, charges resolution report, it gives you some idea um, and why I struggled when I got to high school uh, under item two there where it says an in infrastructure charge that may be levied for material change of use or building work for residential development is generally calculated as follows. Now you got LCR equals in brackets SUM in brackets ACR multiplied by QR in brackets for each defined use minus C. Which, so you don't understand. So, <laughs> so, uh, which which I've put beside my comment, which adds up to infinity. Um, so uh, you can see, I guess, an example of the complicated sort of uh, formulas that Lud works to with regards to get fair and equitable charges for development contributions. So thanks, Lud. Thank you very much. Councillor Jerusalem. Question if I may. Thanks, Lud. Um, uh, being Noosa Council Charge Resolution Number 3, we've gone through 1 and 2, I'm getting most of the uh, principal um, issues underway, I assume, is there, uh, uh, and talking about charges number 4, is there anything significant in this, or are these just basically catching up with some of the minor um, it's minor issues that were still outstanding from the previous two. The charges are exactly the same as they would be today. Yep. It just makes it straight up front and no indexation for us to issue it. So these will be the charge amounts that get issued from now on. Um, so there's no difference to what actually goes out today. Um, the only 
um, other change really is uh, because of Unity Water have their charges, their own charges resolution. Mm -hmm. So there's just minor references um, to that, and the rest is um, just a minor correction. Essentially yeah, housekeeping. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Just, just right. a question, if I may, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, probably to Kim or the planners, or whoever can answer it. Uh, so the money um, for the infrastructure charges, um, in the past, uh, we struggled to collect some of this money. Is there any uh, way that we can sort of um, have some sort of bond or money up front, if you would say? No, uh, in infrastructure charges, they're, a, they're recovered, so they're a rate, so they're actually issued. Yep. We issue a copy of the charge notice to the property owners. We've been doing that since 2004 to advise them that it is a rate on the, on the property. It only becomes payable if the development proceeds and is completed. If they don't pay by the time, then it gets transferred to rates with, and then interest starts applying, and if it's still outstanding after three years, council has the choice to recover it uh, through selling properties if necessary. Okay. But that's been in operation since 2004 under our ICP, yeah. our Coastal Major Road Network. Oh, right. <coughs> um, just another question, if I may. The um, uh, my understanding is, uh, probably to the CEO, we, we suffered, um, I'll say, the Noosa Council, <coughs> the Noosa people suffered an approximate loss in infrastructure charges from the uh, amalgamation, or the deamalgamation, I think from memory, there was about 11 to 12 million that wasn't <coughs> collected, uh, or was <coughs> probably collected, but it didn't come to Noosa <coughs> when, in the deamalgamation process. Is that right, Mr. C? Yeah, what, what happened um, was that up until the 15th of March 2008, the councils were collecting, or well, Noosa Council had collected, um, I'll call them development contributions, <coughs> probably is the term that we're coming back there. Um, had those, you know, in a cash reserve for one of a better phrase. And obviously, yeah. during the amalgamation years between 2008 and 2000, and beginning of 2014, where there was any development, then um, funds were also collected um, during that period. When we came to do the deamalgamation split, there was a fair bit of argy-bargy between Sunshine Coast Regional Council and the uh, Emerging Noosa Council about how the cash reserves were to be split up and whether or not um, specific funds which were raised in a particular area should be returned to that area or whether it formed part of a larger pool that was going to be dealt with at, at regional infrastructure level. So that's where we had a, a big um, argument um, and ultimately the two councils couldn't agree, and it was referred to the Minister, who made a determination that favoured Sunshine Coast Regional Council. There'll be arguments, um, till I go to my grave, that, um, <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that we were right. Um, the amount was between 10 to $12 million that wasn't returned, that we believe was, uh, should have been allocated as it was a result of that, that pool of money. So that was certainly the case. And that was why, I guess, the first couple of years were pretty tight. Yeah. Thank you. Other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Wish to close, councillor? Put the motion in favour. Against, the motion's carried. Next item is, thank you, Lord. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. A minor change to development approval for operational works prescribed title works extension to existing jetty 180 mm -hmm. Heap of Terrace, Nooseville. Councillor Wellington. Yeah, question. Um, it seems to me that this uh, business has been going on for some time, um, certainly well over a year. Can you just advise me if this is correct, that it was in July last year that it came to Council's attention that the jetty didn't comply with its conditions because it abutted the edge of the lease area uh, rather than was set back from the edge of the lease area, that that advice was given to the applicant and the applicant didn't accept that advice, uh, that they believed that the jetty was compliant at that time, and therefore a, a, a show cause notice was, uh, was sent to the applicant. Is that correct? Is that the way it happened? Uh, yes, it is. It did come to our attention around July last year um, through looking at aerial photography, um, that it wasn't compliant. 
Um, we raised it um, with the applicant at the time who indicated that they and the builder had measured it and it complied um, with the approval. Um, uh, it was clear from the aerial photography that it didn't. Um, it's a 2.6 metre difference. Um, so we proceeded to issue a show cause notice to the applicant asking them to either demolish or make application for the changed structure. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm relating to um, this, obviously, um, Patrick, in your report, there seemed to be an explanation of what really went wrong, but then we recently had a letter from the applicant lawyer who seems to have described it in a different way. There's been an error of some sort, but do you have an understanding of where this error has, how it happened? Uh, to be honest, I'm, I'm a bit unclear because um, the original plans that were proposed by the applicant had a setback of 1.4 metres in the original application and then through discussions with council that was amended to 2.6 metres um, and then what was constructed was essentially to the boundary of the lease area, I think it's about 3 centimetres from the lease area, so it's not like but the advice that I was given that was that they constructed to some wrong plans, mm -hmm. but I'm a bit curious because the plans that we saw only had a 1.4 metre setback originally. originally. Right. There was never a, a plan that actually had it constructed to the boundary. So, okay. the um, yeah. And um, how does the 2.6 metre thing get arrived at? Um, as part of that original application, um, the applicant was advised that we had concerns with the setback that was proposed because yeah. it would result in craft. Um, that we're refueling being outside the lease area. Yeah. And the advice that we received, and it's detailed in the report that came from the applicant, um, was that uh, a distance of 2.6 metres would be suitable. That's specified in page 16. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, there's a comment, the widest vessel in their fleet that could possibly moor on the end of the jetty is 2.6 metres wide. Mm -hmm. our, happy would be, uh, our client would be happy to reduce the length of the jetty pontoon by a minimum of 2.6 metres, enabling mm -hmm. the widest vessel to moor. Mm -hmm. so, that it, it came through discussions with the applicant. So that was a letter from them? That was an email from, from the applicant who, who was, I think, um, the actual pilot, I think they're called, okay. that were engaged by the owner. Yeah. So may I also ask, as I understand it from the applicant, they have, they, they're the only diesel fueling station on the river, is that correct? Uh, as they've advised, that's the case, that's correct. I'm not aware um, of any others. And resultant from that is that, um, there are boats that come there, the water police come there, the coast guard and fisheries um, boats come there to get diesel, which apparently have an ongoing account here at this Pelican jetty. And those boats range from being 4.5 meters wide to eight wow. meters wide. So I'm actually wondering about how, how can this be that such large boats have to get diesel somewhere, and this seems to be the only place. How relevant is it that there be a 2.6 meter setback, given that many boats that come there have are bigger? Well, um, I suppose that's contrary to the advice that we received in the initial application, where we were advised that the widest vessel in their fleet that could possibly moor was 2.6 meters. So at that time, we based our decision on, on the advice by the applicant. Right. Councillor Joyce. Yeah, that, that seems to be the discrepancy. I mean, the, the vessels in their fleet versus other vessels that may um, refuel there is, uh, seems to be um, some point of discrepancy. So there was no mention at any stage of other vessels apart from their own fleet vessels? No, this is the only communication that I've... And the other, the other part that seems to come up is the discrepancy between the, the terminology of mooring and, and tying up for refuelling purposes. I mean... Is there any differentiation in the um, approval with, or, uh, or, or in the, uh, the act with regard to how mooring uh, being more permanent as opposed to tying up for um, refuelling purposes, uh, uh, how they are perceived? There's no definition of mooring in the planning scheme. Um, we have reviewed the definition within uh, the dictionary and it doesn't indicate that the mooring has to be for an extended period of time. I think it's relevant to note also that the scheme asks for all commercial activity mm. 
inside the lease. So it doesn't make reference to mooring, docking, or the like. It says commercial activity. Right. So I think um, any boats refueling there would have to be considered part of the commercial activity. So, of follow that jetty. so sorry. So following on from Councillor Jackson's question, with regard to if this is then built to specification at two point, uh, uh, the plans that were submitted at 2.6 metre setback, and we have vessels that are greater than 2.6 metres refuelling there, does that mean we have ongoing illegal activity regardless? Well, there's two, two matters here. There's the lease conditions, which is really for the state to determine, and their conditions suggest that activity has to happen inside the lease. Um, and then it would come back to um, the council approval for operational <coughs> works, which asks for all boats to be moored inside the lease area. Um, so we would have to look closely at the definition of mooring versus docking versus tying up boats. And you'd go, because it's not defined by the planning scheme or as far as I know, the planning regulations, we'd have to go to the Macquarie Dictionary is usually what the lawyers do then for their definitions. My, my, <laughs> question, my question still relates to if uh, we currently apply the 2.6 metre as per the plan and that doesn't suffice for the vessels that are there, should we be reviewing the 2.6 metres well, it is a in condition. these discussions? It is a condition at the moment, so it, it remains unless the applicant um, seeks for a change in that regard. So. Um, yeah, so it, it would, if council refuses that up, this application, then that condition would re remain on the approval and we'll have to review it at that time. Uh, council, last one for question. Yeah, on that discussion about Joe about it being outside the 2.6 metre area and you're basically you're just going to be putting the boats out there anyway. From my understanding, you've got to the left of it, you've got the Catalina that's a little bit outside the leased area. You've got the ferry pulling up at the boathouse that's outside a little bit of the leased area. You've got Ricky's, which is just outside of, of Downland's, or and the Sofitel. I did do some investigation. T-Boats is actually has a 4.1 metre setback from their leased area, so the ferry is pulling up. So there, there's a, there is already this commercial operation happening outside of these leased area boundaries. Um, if we open up this can of worms here with, you know, we're not... I can't say what it says. It says mooring and whatever it says somewhere. I can't recall it. Uh, we're not mooring there. We're only having a, an activity pulling and pulling out. Are we opening up a can of worms and we're going to be reviewing all these jetties or is it just this particular one? Um, I'm not sure I agree that there is a can of worms. Um, so review of it, um, this is the only structure that's been built to the edge of the lease. The others are built inside of it. So the boathouse at the time that was in was argued that that was a boat and not a structure. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Some councillors will remember. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, so it actually has no operational works approval for jetty as such. So they argued at the time it was a jetty, whether it's, uh, sorry, a boat, whether it still remains a boat or is now a structure, that's something we'd have to look at. But if you look at the Sofitel, the jetty for that is built well inside the lease area, not to the edge. Um, Ricky's does not have a, a lease, uh, so it's a bit different again. So, um, yeah, there may be some areas where boats um, are being moored or docked outside the lease, um, but nevertheless the structures are well within that lease area and activities outside that lease falls back to the state to manage, not council. So just following on from that, uh, do you know, we have a one location, Harbour Town, where we pump effluent and so forth out of houseboats and so forth. What's that, what's that called? Yeah, it's a pump so out pump facility. Out, mm. yeah, it's the pump out, which is a council facility, right? Where we allow our houseboats to run no. up. No, 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 not a council. Private. Private, is it? Yeah. Mm. From my understanding, does that operate in the same situation where everything happens inside the leased area? Because um. from the very small <coughs> investigation I've done on it, the boat. Is that, this is, this is that at Mill Street? Yeah, there, is, yeah. there is one at Mill Street. Yeah, yeah. 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 Slipway. Yeah. Slipway. Yeah. Um, is there one, one somewhere down? Well, I think from, from, from aerial photos, the um, infrastructure on that is, is set back inside the lease area as well. But from what I saw down the other day, the boats were coming up inside. The houseboats are quite wide now. Mm. Like they're still operating outside yeah. the leased area, much like this 
Yeah. But this fueling station is so. Can we not? Is there not just some sort of common sense approach where, you know, <laughs> these people are pulling in, getting fuel, and leaving in, a, in a quite a easy, <coughs> fashionable manner? So exactly what's happening with the pump out station, where they actually the houseboats are quite big and. They look. They look. Like, I don't. I haven't seen the exact detail. They look like they're outside the least area in, in some. I think you'd have to have it. Sorry, just have to have a look at it and see. Yeah. Yeah. How, how obviously that, don't know that. I mean, well, where's so, how far is the lease going? What to, what we can up. say is the jetties and structures are all built well within the lease area. This one is the one that's outside the square, built to the edge. Um, there may be activity outside the lease, but the jetties and the structures are well within the lease. Isn't that a common sense approach to say, look, you know, you've got you've got a, a meter and a half of a houseboat getting outside this pump out session, and you've got maybe. Uh, are you getting into yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Please, okay. thanks, Mr. Chair. Oh no, I, I was going to move it, but I'll. Yeah, I'm not wait. I've got one more question. Just yeah, that's yes. a yeah, um, I would presume that pumping with petrol is environmentally relevant activity. And I would presume that the environmentally relevant activity could not take place outside of its approved area, which would be that they couldn't put a nozzle over their lease boundary. Would that be correct? Um, well, I don't think it's any longer environmentally relevant activity. Yeah. So the state had a green tape reduction program some time back. So potentially it was at one stage, and so that approval would still remain current, but it's not potentially any more. Not, any not ERAs, or they still ERAs and they don't need yeah. annual inspections? It's not ERA, so oh, yeah. yeah the approval still exists though and continue on with those up. Can we can we just but I, I research that a bit further? Because me can have a look, yeah. The, yeah. the biggest thing is well, one of the things is that we haven't talked about is that's, 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 the so question about question. marine pollution as well. Is the next question. Yeah. It's about whether there is also then no a flow on in terms of the nature of the activity to any uh, liability. And it might be a question for Thursday on on marine pollution and the and the, the pumping of petrol being outside of the lease area. Yeah. Councillor Jackson. Right, and the other, the other concern, uh, sort of addressing what Councillor Jackson, uh, Councillor um, Glasgow was addressing there, is that uh, the activity here will actually occur in navigable, navigable, try and get that word out, navigable global channels. Hmm, that's right. Thank Extending you. further out into the river. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I've got two more questions. One is actually this about the extending further out thing, and again back to the fact that it seems that some of the boats that come there to refuel will extend further out anyway, and as it's the only usual location, I'm not clear what whether this 2.6 is so important. Can you sort of explain why it matters if if they're going to stick out anyway? Yeah. Okay. Well. The planning scheme seeks that all commercial activity for these leases occur inside the lease area. So when, when we're looking at applications uh, for jetties or expansion to the jetty, we try and seek to ensure that that scheme requirement is met. Um, so when the applicant first <coughs> proposed an extension to this jetty, it had a setback of 1.4, 1.4, which we certainly considered um, inadequate, seeing that most boats would fall outside it. At the time, the applicant submitted uh, 2.6 metres was sufficient to fit all their boats, uh, is my understanding. So that's where the 2.6 metres came from. It came from the applicant. Um, we took them at their face value that that was the width that was required to ensure activity occurred inside. Mm -hmm. um, so that 2.6 metres came from the applicant and the intent to try and keep commercial activity in the lease, which is a scheme requirement, but also the lease requirements by the state. And is commercial activity the action of fueling or is commercial activity the very fact that a boat has arrived? And has well, I think it's there. any activity associated with the jetty. So certainly it would be fueling, um, loading or unloading passengers, if that's the business that's occurring well, in that lease area. Assumably the actual passengers are unloading in the lease area, they're yeah. getting off the boat. Yeah. This is what I'm wondering, I mean the boat itself isn't commercial activity, is it? It's the, if you're unloading, the people are getting mm -hmm. onto the jetty mm -hmm. and they're getting into the lease area, so is that really not a commercial activity? Uh, well I see whether you're um, you know, tying up your boat at the end of the jetty and collecting fuel, that that whole activity should occur in the lease. Otherwise, right. some of that activity is occurring yeah. outside of it. 
Um, um, one other question is around, um, as I understand it from the applicant, it, it is because this is a fuel system, it's not just a matter of trimming it. It would mean it means on the whole diesel fuel system because of the nature of such a safety issue, which would probably cost about 150000 to redo. Um, is that something that either council can take into consideration when making decisions about having to change something? Or would the courts likely to take that into consideration of whether that amount of cost is really worthwhile? Mm. Um, well, the, the Planning Act actually goes there in terms of saying that people's personal financial, or people's personal circumstances, including financial, is not a relevant consideration um, to planning applications, to impact accessible applications. It's not quite specific in terms of going there in terms of change applications, but the, the thought is that that would follow on down the line to the next application to a change application as well. So um, the thought is the courts would give very little weight uh, to that issue for the applicant. I mean, they may raise it, but, and I'm not the court to know what they'd say, but um, certainly the thought is they wouldn't give a lot of weight mm. to that. Well, I, I did put forward that I would move a um, deferral motion in, in response to the request of the applicant, and so I would like to do that. Can I ask a question first? Um, the act of deferring this sort of application, does that, that trigger a deemed refusal? Uh, no, it doesn't. So, oh, sorry, it would trigger a deemed refusal if the applicant lodges something with the court. But otherwise, it can sit, just sit there for council to make a decision. So there's no time critical no. element. In no. Okay. So, I, yeah, I'd like to move the deferral oh, motion. So, I'll move Councillor Jackson, seconded Councillor Blasco. Councillor. Yes. Um, so really we're just removing the motion and making it a procedural motion to defer. Can, so for the sake of those watching, perhaps uh, Councillor Jackson could read the motion out, sure. it's quite short. The Council note the report by the Coordinator Planning and Planning, planning <coughs> to the Planning and Environment Committee meeting, which of course now is General Committee, dated 10th of September regarding this application to make a minor change to an existing approval for extension to an existing jetty situated at jetty 180 Gilby Terrace, Nusaville, and agree to defer the matter to a future council meeting as requested by the applicant to allow further discussions and determine if a resolution can be found. And the um, question period that we just had, I think there seems to be a fair bit of ambiguity um, around definitions and around what the issue really is. And um, I suppose the question of whether there is some solution that could be found. Um, so because there's no time criticality, it would seem a reasonable thing to accept a um, recommended deferral, um, get the lawyers to talk to each other about the legal matters, and to do this before going to the expense of going to court, which of course um, is a much more um, complex and uh, serious matter. And so I suggest starting with that opportunity to, to just defer and have a discussion and try to see if things can be understood better between the parties. Thank you. Anybody wish to speak against the amendment? Councillor Wellington? Yeah, I won't be supporting the amendment unless someone convinces me otherwise before we get to vote on it. Um, this isn't really, I, I don't actually accept that there's ambiguity here because we're dealing with a planning matter and we're dealing with a uh, condition relating to a planning approval and that condition was clear. In fact, amusingly, the condition was actually recommended by the applicant and that is to have a 2.6 metre setback. I remind councillors that in July last year, uh, once the uh, structure had been built, advice was sent by council to the applicant that the uh, structure wasn't meeting its conditions and the applicant disagreed with council, which ended up with council having to uh, issue a show cause notion. 
So it's not really, the issue isn't really about how much space do boats have and how much of the boats will go over the, uh, to, you know, over, over the lease area, etc. This is really about the fact that the applicant established and recommended the conditions. Our staff took that recommendation on good faith, wrote it into the conditions of development. The applicant has not met the conditions that they recommended themselves and is now asking for a reprieve. In fact, they're not just asking for a reprieve. In the correspondence we've seen, they have said, uh, we're going to appeal the matter. I don't believe we should be making decisions either on the basis of threats of legal action and appeals. Uh, the applicant, as I say, originally suggested the 2.6 metres. They didn't meet their own recommendation. Arguably, they are in error. And I believe, therefore, that a deferral is not actually going to change anything because if they're not still willing to accept the fact that they made a mistake and that mistake needs to be uh, repaired or, or, or uh, uh, altered in some way, then we're just going to be back here in a month's time with exactly the same report. I, I cannot see that anything's going to change if we're dealing with a planning matter. Put the business of how much of boats are over the lease aside in dealing with the planning matter, we're going to be back in the same situation in a month. I can't support a deferral. Councillor Plaster. Um, there is a lot of ambiguity around this, I believe. The fact that we're even talking about the word ambiguity means there's amb ambiguity. So uh, a, a, month, a month look at this again is not a huge time frame and scheme of things. This is the only jetty on the, on the river supporting the Coast Guard, the Catalina, many other boats pumping diesel. There's a big industry around us, and you know, if we've got the possibility of losing this jetty or this industry, it's going to be a big downfall for the river. And a month in the grand scheme of things is not a, not a long time. From my from my knowledge, there has been some paperwork and some plans and some blaming of who's doing what, but it's not quite clear yet. So I think we need another another four week to kind of iron those things out exactly where the, the indiscrepancy came from and the ambiguity, I would say. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff written in that report, like, you know, navigational hazard. Who made that call? Uh, was this a professional maritime person in, in the planning scheme? No offence, but I don't even think most accounts have a boat. So, um, you know, there's a lot of... There's a lot of stuff. Uh, Mr Chair, I'm sorry, point of order, the councillor should not be making disparaging comments about the staff. Uh, sorry, I retract that. You're right. My apologies. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, and I just think for, for the grand scheme of things, this, this industry is here, and, and in four weeks is not is not going to be a, a long time to sort of to iron these these creases out. And like I said, there's a few things in there that I don't it doesn't it doesn't come clear to me, and ambiguity I think is, is through it. So I fully support the uh, deferral. Councillor Park. Yeah, <clears throat> I won't be supporting the deferral um, motion before us, Mr. Chair. The um, Normally, well, quite often, I've supported deferral motions if I think there's some, some sort of negotiation and going forward. Um, but basically here, um, the, the, between now and Thursday night, what we do today, or what we sign off on today, what motions we move and support today, there's, there's time between now and Thursday night. Thursday night's the final vote we have here of council. If there's some new evidence or you know new plans or something goes forward between uh, now and Thursday night, can come before us and we can have a look at, at that time. Um, so there's time to have a look at it, and people want to discuss or find ways forward. But um, uh, but I won't be supporting the deferral. I agree with the mayor's comments that. Um, we're, we're kicking this around. It's been kicked around since July last year, obviously, because that's when they were told they're not meeting their planning performance, their uh, conditions. Thank you. I'd just like to ask a question based on Councillor Pardon's discussion there. Is, is, would the staff be open to meeting with the applicant between now and Thursday night to discuss any new situation or evidence that may be pertinent to this application? We're always open to meetings, um, but I'd have to suggest this application has been around for a year. There has been an on-site meeting uh, where there was no solutions put forward. What we have before us is a letter from p &E Law challenging us on our decision-making, which we've had reviewed 
um, by our solicitor who doesn't agree with their solicitor. So I don't, I don't, I wouldn't recommend that council defer the matter. I think um, the best uh, position is actually potentially to let it go to appeal because then there's formal mediation okay. in the court. Thanks, Kelly. It's Sorry. Beyond well asked. Uh, was, <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is it would be open to a meeting with the applicant yeah. to discuss any new information yeah, that may be pertinent to this application. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I have a related question to Councillor Wilkins uh, and relating to what Councillor Pyden said. And in that council party said if some evidence was available before the order meeting, is there a process that that is the case? That if there was further information brought before the order meeting that, that could be provided to councillors? I'm not sure what councillor party meant. There. Sorry, just ask your question again. Yes, councillor pardon said that he would welcome any additional evidence before the ordinary meeting, which might change things. Is that actually part of the protocol? Is that possible for some additional evidence to be provided before the ordinary meeting? Yes, that's, that's always possible. So if the applicant put forward um, a way, an alternative way to resolve this, I think that's something we could consider between now and Thursday. Yeah. Also, I guess I shall ask, and it's related to Councillor Wilkie's question. Uh, my understanding from the letter from the applicant is that they were seeking for the lawyers to talk to each other, not just for staff to talk to the applicant. Is that something that can happen? Well, I'd suggest a preferred way to do that is through an appeal and a formal mediation process that the court register oversees. I think that's the preferential way to have lawyers uh, speak. I don't know if hmm. Brett wants to say anything on that. Oh, yeah, my experience is that having lawyers talking and going back and forward before an appeal tends to drag things on. Mm. Um, you don't generally get a res resolution. It's just the experience I've had over the years. Uh, I don't know why, but that's what tends to happen. Yeah. Whereas you get to the hard edge of an appeal and things tend to coalesce a lot better and you get a resolution through a, a formal court mediation is sometimes much better. <laughs> it's one of those inexplicable things. <laughs> two lawyers get together and end up with three opinions. So. Sorry, for a further question, if I may, Mr. CEO, that would also uh, require some sort of a, a time frame uh, to be applied to uh, some sort of a, a, a process. Yeah, and that's perhaps why it tends to work better in formal mediation, because there's a, a, a framework and a time frame that tends to bring that together. Uh, Councillor, there I'll speak to the uh, to the uh, deferral motion, and I'm, I won't be uh, supporting it. Um, talk about ambiguity; it, it only adds another element of ambiguity, and that not not giving any time frame with regard to when that uh, matter come, may come before council. Uh, and uh, for this process to go on. I think, uh, as uh, staff have alluded to, there is a formal process and a mediation process that this can uh, can go to. Um, it's clear that uh, if, if there was a, a building application before us on, on land and that, uh, and uh, a developer had developed to the boundary when a, a six metre or other setback had been required, we wouldn't be um, accepting that application. And I think the same, the same rules apply here. I think it needs to go through due process to, uh, to get to a result. Yeah, I, 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 we'll talk. I think as councillors, we always find it somewhat difficult to make decisions where we know it's going to cost unexpected resources to the applicant. But in this case, any other developer who made a error of this magnitude would have significant costs in, in rectifying it. Uh, if this was a petrol station on this on the land they built to the boundary and they required cars to pull up on the road. There is no way we'd be allowing the use to continue. So the clear matter is they've had a year to resolve it or more. They've made a fundamental error, like a very fundamental error, um, that is mind blowing uh, to suggest it was uh, in any way um, something that shouldn't have happened. And unfortunately, the consequence of it is that. Their, their change of approval is one suggesting something that we haven't approved on the river before and we shouldn't do for the future. So I can't, I don't think there are, I, I think it's a fairly clear case that one will only be resolved um, in one way and that will be through an appeal process. Oh, look, I, I have some sympathy for the applicant in this case. Um, the, as it says in the report, the applicant indicated changes are. Um, are required as a result of the builder constructing the jetty incorrectly. 
and locating the extended structure within the required 2.6 metre setback. As we heard from staff, the applicant's builder advised they had measured the jetty and it complied. So, if there's any expense to be borne here, um, I would, if you take this on face value, value, it would suggest that there are some talks to take place between the applicant and the builder. Um, the builder has not constructed the jetty uh, according, to the, uh, according to the conditions, and that is a great concern for, that must be a huge concern for the applicant. Um, but uh, the 2.6 metre setback was requested by the applicant, agreed to by the applicant. The state lease conditions, the nurse planning scheme requires there be an adequate setback and that all commercial activity takes place inside the lease area. I don't see it as ambiguous, but I, if there is more discussions to be had and there is more information to be presented for the, the planners and councillors to consider, there is a time frame between now and Thursday night when that can take place. And, um, and we've heard that the staff are always open to meeting with the applicant to discuss any new information that might be pertinent to the application. So. Um, unfortunately, I, I won't be able to support this um, referral um, motion. And Kat, we'll just see the original paragraph up there, please. You know, I do know that there's no it, there's no date by which um, this has to come back to the council. So this could it has gone on for a year, and by the wording of this this motion, it could um, go on for uh, an indefinite period. And, and that's not to the benefit of, of any of the stakeholders. Um, good question. Yes, um, I'm the mover of the motion, and the motion, thank you, was provided to me by Kim, and that's Kerry, and we did not include a time frame, but I would be very much welcoming a time frame. Um, so I'm not sure, I, I simply took advice and have given the motion that was prepared for me by staff, but as a mover of the motion, I would have no difficulty adding in a time frame if that could be appropriately amended. I can't amend because I need the motion, sure. but if um, both of us, yeah. the secondary mover, agree to a t an appropriate time frame, we could um, put a time frame if that's an issue. Uh, can I just come forward under the new standing orders? That's not appropriate. Can't do it. Not just been moved, seconded, and discussed. It can't be amended. Uh, no, no, that's not quite true. Yeah. Just just my, I'm just quickly reading it. No, <laughs> no, standing orders. No, yes. So, section 26.4 is Councillor Stockholm. A motion or amendment may be withdrawn or modified by the mover thereof with the consent of the seconder and council. So, if, uh, the, yeah. if the council meeting agrees oh, and the right. mover and the seconder we agree, then it can be modified. Right. Right. But if the so in other words, Councillor <laughs> Jackson and Councillor Glasgow had agreed to this. Everyone else would need to agree before that modification could occur. If any one councillor didn't agree, it wouldn't occur. Okay. Well, could we just do that? Um, could you recommend an appropriate time frame, and we'll just go through this little process and see if that would be okay. Well, the, I guess well, should we say the next council next round. round? Next round of council. Yeah, next round of council. Yeah. Okay. So if we could. And I just, would you be happy with yeah, that? Totally, that's so instead of saying next, next, next month, you mean, yeah. <laughs> next round. Next round. Yeah. Next round. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so then, yes. Well, I, I, I guess the, the question I have now is do all councillors consent to that change? Yeah. Fine. Yeah. No problem. No. No. Yeah, I'll, do we have to, I would be do against we, it because I think it's process wise, I don't like it. Uh, I don't think that after you have a debate that you try and change motion to respond to a um, point made in debate. I think that's not good, not good process, therefore I won't support it. I don't care, we talk about against it. Oh, okay. Yeah. We'll accept the, uh, the change here, whether that changes anybody's opinion on uh, um, on the recommendation at the, at the end of the day, we get to it. So, so if, I mean, if we haven't voted on it yet, so. Yeah, so under the, I said under that new provision in our new standing orders that the amendment um, can't be modified without the consent of the mover, seconder, and the council. Yes. So well, we have we, we have a dissent, so therefore it can't be changed. Correct. But what I think 
counsel did it said it's correct. If this is lost, then you can move an alternative or whatever it might be. Find your okay. 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 We're just, we're just okay. delaying the yeah. inevitable order yeah. for another motion to come before us, Brian. But there you go. Oh, Councillor Jackson, you have the right to close. To a principal, I can hear it. Your motion. Yeah, your sure. Motion. I'll just close right. by right. saying yeah. that I, I'm always seeking for ways to resolve issues and, and, and the lowest costs and the lowest hassles, so I, I felt this would be an appropriate. Um, to do, given the request of the applicant. Yes. I'll put the motion those in favour. That's Councillors Jackson and Blasco. And those against? Kathy, are you preempting the voting there? She doesn't listen to the debate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, against <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Wellington, yes. pardon, Jerusalem, Stockwell, and Wilkie. Sorry. And to avoid. Councillor Jurisdiction's concerned, I'll move the motion recommended by staff. Um, I'll second it. Uh, motion moved by Councillor Stockwell, second of Councillor Wellington. Uh, I, I won't speak to it. I'll, if there's anything to, to respond to, I'll do that. Okay. Any other councillors wish to speak to this motion? Uh, Councillor Wellington? Yeah, look, um, as has been noted, the fact that it's on water is near, neither here nor there, this uh, development. Um, as other councillors have noted, if it were on land, there would be little question about refusing uh, to accept the fact that uh, the uh, development didn't meet its conditions. Uh, it was, it's been mentioned that the builder is not constructed according to conditions. I remind councillors that the applicant, not the builder, the applicant insisted that it was built and did comply with the conditions when he was advised by staff that it didn't. Therefore, it is the applicant's responsibility, not the builder's responsibility. And given that the applicant has already engaged legal advice, it seems that the uh, legal process seems to be the obvious way to resolve this, not through any other process. They've already decided that by sending a legal letter to councillors. They've decided this is a legal matter. Let them go to appeal. That's the way to do it. Thank you. Yeah, this appears to be a dispute between the applicant and, uh, and their builder. Uh, the builder clearly hasn't uh, uh, built to uh, the plans as provided, uh, and I think that's something they need to resolve uh, amongst themselves more so than uh, with council in the first process. And uh, secondly, I don't think the uh, the 2.6 metre setback that uh, that, that was uh, applied is uh, is going to be adequate here anyway. So I think there's going to, have to be some major modifications for this. Uh, to comply as a fueling station for all the, uh, the vessels that uh, that do pull up there in the, in the long run. So I think there's uh, far more going to uh, need to be resolved here through mediation than uh, than uh, the application before us. Councillor Pardon. Yeah, um, Mr Chair, yeah, <coughs> planning's not my strong suit and um, I'm, I like Councillor Jackson. Oh, um, uh, if we could find a way forward um, that um, suits all parties it'd be good but i don't i don't think given um, what's happened here that that's going to be that simple um thus so i support this motion the interesting thing remembering back um there was a lot of argy bargy amongst councillors and staff with regards to this setback uh, and we've actually given ground i think to find we, we actually give ground because it was 1.4 metres uh, that the applicant, you know, that's what was envisaged. And we said um, no. And then the applicant actually, um, you know, sent a letter and advised us that they would pull it back to 2.6, which, so we've actually, in my opinion, trying to remember back that we'd given ground on this particular application. We actually tried to find a way you know, to give a bit, to help out this applicant. Um, and thus, uh, the 2.6 was arrived at. Now, that's not an arbitrary figure. It's where um, we've landed, I guess, in, in um, negotiations with the applicant. So um, people are quite right to say, well, boats are, you know, three and a half, four metres wide, and there's thus some will be outside. That's true. But... That's not relevant to what we're discussing here. We'd given ground. What we said is we're trying to keep um, everything inside their lease, boats, usage inside the lease. And when we got to 2.6, many of us would have known that vessels are wider. There is wider vessels. So you, you've given a bit. You're saying, well, you can park a bit in the river anyway because 2.6 doesn't cover the width of a lot of the big vessels. So whilst we'd given a lot of ground, 
to this development application, then we find there's a mistake and um, there's no setback virtually, but three centimetres, so, which is kind of ridiculous. Um, so, you know, sometimes when you try and land uh, in a give and take position or, or find a good position, um, and that's arguable with the 2.6 that we, that we agreed to, what was a good position? And then on top of that, we have the Noosa River <coughs> plan and what we're trying to do there with regards to uh, the river, um, clutter, etc. And we're trying not to um, push more um, vessels, if you use that word, or have more um, clutter out into the river. So, you know, it doesn't tick any boxes, this. I, I think it's, it's a lose-lose. Whilst I feel for the developer, um, but they seem to be saying the builder made a mistake. Well, I'd be still looking for him somewhere uh, if he made that big a mistake, because that's quite a mistake um, to make. It's, it's a big mistake. And so they need to be talking to thrash this out. Anyway, I support the motion before us. The councillors wish to speak to the motion. Um, Councillor Stockwell, do you wish to sign your right reply? Okay, I put the motion. Those in favour? Councillors Wellington, Jurisovic, Stockwell, Pardon, Wilkie. Those against? Councillor Jackson and Councillor Glasgow. So the motion is carried. We now go on to. Thank you, Patrick. We now go on to item three, which is the development application material change of use for 16 ancillary dwelling units at 64 Gateway Drive, Nooseville, on page 25 of the Planning and Environment Committee's meeting agenda. Councillors, mm -hmm. questions for staff? I have a question. Councillor Jackson. Um, in it looks like an application for units. <laughs> but then I notice in the report there's been some previous um, approvals of units in the area. Three ancillary dwelling units and two ancillary dwelling units previously. Can you just fill us in on what yeah. that's about? Um, well, uh, caretakers' residents are currently supported in the industrial area. Um, so there is a, a genuine need for caretakers' residents in the industrial area, and there's been some approved on other, site, other sites. And as the applicant points out, three in some cases. Um, and this is something we have only just started seeing recently where people have... Typically, we've only had one ever proposed on a site. In recent times, we've had some industrial sites propose three caretakers' residents. And while we accepted that that was potentially required, when we got an application for 16, we just um, realised this is not just a caretakers' residence, it's a multiple dwelling. So um, I think it's just the sheer number that really highlights to us that it's not really a caretakers in this instance, that they are multiple dwellings. And certainly the size of the units and the size of the tenancies is all I also highlighting that because they're not really subordinate when they're um, the size they are. I've got a question for staff. Councillor Wellington. Um, I understand that elsewhere we have had situations where um, people have chosen to reside in the industrial area and that has created conflicts as a result of noise and amenity issues. In fact, I think there might be a, such a situation behind a certain brewery in the industrial area at the moment. Can you confirm? Uh, whether or not this has occurred before in terms of uh, conflicts between residential use and industrial use? Yeah, we have had instances where we've received um, uh, complaints um, about someone residing in the residential er in the industrial area without a caretaker's approval. Mm -hmm. um, that's the only one though I recall. I think Tony's question was more about yeah. whether or not people who are actually residing in those have ever had complaints about adjoining the Yeah, I don't recall okay. any complaints related to that. Councillor uh, Yeah, I noticed on page 32 of your report, you, um, at the time of writing the report, you referred to the settings of the draft planning scheme. Mm -hmm. Considering we've now taken the next step of publicly responding to um, 
the major uh, submissions and on today, uh, if the, those changes are made public, we should pay pay uh, attention to what is in the draft planning scheme, and I know and I believe it may have changed uh, from what's in the report. So, is the, can you give us a highlight of just what might have changed in the draft planning scheme relating to the, the caretakers' accommodation that might be relevant to this decision? Um, there has been um, some strengthening of the provisions in the draft planning scheme around um, caretakers' residence and, and their purpose. Um, they are, um, it, by all accounts, around um, caretaking for a property in an industrial estate uh, where the business uh, or the needs of that um, business require caretaking potentially over overnight or for 24 hours. Um, so there's been some strengthening of the provisions to be clear about um, the purpose of caretaker's residence. Um, there also has, and subsequent to that with the strengthening of the code provisions, uh, we have actually proposed that the at caretaker's residence going forward, um, if they meet those provisions, um, are no longer impact accessible but can be code accessible. Uh, from recollection, there was some area uh, criteria about one every two thousand square meters that's or correct. one per site. Sorry, Councillor Stocko. Yes, that's correct. To be um, more specific, um, the draft planning scheme says that uh, one caretaker residence per two thousand square meters of property. Councillor Wellington. Uh, two questions. Uh, firstly. Um, are you aware of concerns raised by residents in the residential zone that is uh, aligned beside this subject site of their concerns about noise and amenity in their residential area as a result of this industrial area? Uh, yes, I have uh, seen some correspondence from residents who adjoin the site. Um, we didn't seem to know that the site was going to be developed for industrial. Um, uh, but there are a number of uh, provisions in that approval to help protect their amenity. Um, yeah, so I'm aware. So, and, and that's as a result of what sort of conditions? So no windows on that side, a buffer, etc. That's that right? right. So no windows and openings on that side, um, a, a fence, um, substantial setback, sort of buffer area. Um, all activity to occur you know, away from that boundary. And all of this is in order to protect the residential amenity from the, whatever activities occur in the industrial area. That's right. That's the, right. the sort of protection that couldn't actually occur if the residential area was sitting on top of the industrial area. Exactly. A lot more difficult to do. To, mm. They're not very compatible where you've got um, industrial and residential on the same site. And, and a question for Kim Rawlings. In our consideration, uh, referring to the um, new Noosa plan and how it deals with the interrelationship of residential and industrial at the business centre, the Shire Business Centre, I understand that we have made a determination uh, to ensure that residential is further removed from the industrial area at that site. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. And again, in order to avoid conflict between industry and residential. Yeah, absolutely. There's a there's an existing uh, industrial area that um, abuts the Shire Business Centre, and in order to respect that and maintain the integrity of that, we have removed um, potential residential um, from the draft planning scheme to to avoid any reverse amenity impacts. So just to follow up with Councillor Stockwell's questions, um, I really don't see the dimensions of the, 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 the property here outlaid. So um, given the uh, uh, few provisions in the, uh, or the clarifications in the draft planning scheme with regard to the number of uh, um, re caretakers' residences that would be permitted for an industrial um, allotment of this size, what would be the maximum number of um, caretaker units allowed on this uh, on this site? Um, I uh, believe the provisions still say one per site. That's, that would be my yeah. understanding of it. And at yeah. the moment there are something like 42 industrial lots here. Do I understand that correctly? And the potential for 16, we've got num one to 42 numbered. Oh, tenancies. Tenancies, yes. Yeah, so... Um, so 40, 42 potential tenancies and 16 ancillary dwellings on top of that. That's right. But Thank the scheme you. is per site, not tenancy. Thank you. So that does seem, yep. yeah. Just to get a... Uh, uh, I'm happy to move uh, the staff recommendation as a motion. I'll second it. 
Move Councillor Wellington to second the Council of Jerusalem. Councillor Wellington. Um, this is clearly an attempt to create an industrial community within the residential zoning, um, and it's inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, Other a, res a residential community in an industrial zone. Thank you. What did that <laughs> say? Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to walk backwards for the rest. Of <laughs> um, obviously, it's going to generate conflict. It, it can't help but, and we're creating a rod for our backs if we approve it. Um, I'd point out too that 10 of the units actually have floor areas greater than 50% of the industrial use that they sit above. Uh, so it's hardly subordinate. In fact, it, uh, is, it becomes a, a more primary purpose of the land and it's not the purpose of the land to be residential but rather industrial. Um, there's no way in the world that um, we should be approving this uh, given uh, our endeavours within the planning scheme to get this right. Look, I'll concur with the, uh, uh, the Mayor's um, uh, comments there, but also uh, the uh, information from staff that uh, on the site of this site, uh, if a caretaker, if a caretaker residence was uh, to be approved, that one would be uh, sufficient for to, to manage the entire site. It re really, caretaker residents are not a, a given. There has to be a purpose, a rhyme and reason, a purpose for a caretaker's residence. Uh, uh, being associated with an industrial site, and that uh, that, that purpose is that uh, to manage activities that uh, may go into the evening and the rest. It's not designed to provide a living residence for someone on site uh, as a consequence of there their being that uh, capability. Uh, also here, I mean, the numbers clearly uh, uh, overwhelm the number of uh, units and the uh, size uh, discrepancies there, so I can't support um, uh, the, the, concept, uh, the, the concept of 16 um, residential units on an industrial site in any way, shape or form. Councillor Palmer. Yeah, um, Mr Chair. Yeah, I, I can't su I support the, the refusal, of course, um, for all the reasons so far that have been said. Uh, with regards to complaints up there, uh, I was in amongst, um, there was three different people living in one of the complexes. Uh, that I think Michael Cantori some time back was dealing with. There was a motor mechanic, yeah. uh, a young <coughs> girl, and um, <coughs> there was also a furniture importer. Uh, they were all living in the one complex. And this, this did cause um, some <coughs> angst and complaints. So from my history, I do know there's some complaints. Others are, you know, it's up, <coughs> up to other people to put forward if they've been in amongst them. But... Certainly, I've been in amongst complaints in the industrial, the conflict in the industrial area. Also, I've been in amongst, as most councillors have, non-conforming uses in the industrial area. area. That's been pretty heavy to uh, topic. <coughs> and um, in the planning scheme, we've endeavoured, or the proposed new planning scheme that we've gone out to the public with, we've proposed <coughs> to um, do some changes. Um, I had that written down, that one caretaker in the 2,000 square metres. Mm. Councillor Stockwell cut me grass there. I was just trying to show that I was actually listening <laughs> at those meetings and had taken some small part on board. I thought you, I thought, I thought you weren't good at planning, Councillor. Oh, I know. And he's done me like a dinner there. But anyway, look... Um, did, <laughs> It shows the innovation of people, really. Um, me, I'm thinking backpackers immediately, 16 and, you know, units in there and Lovely, yeah. opportunities. And, you know, good on them for being innovative, but the conflict, it just doesn't fit. It, it won't fit and we will have conflicts. So, you know, I support the refusal. Thank you. Councillor Stockwell. Yeah, it's interesting. It's um, a good idea in the wrong spot. Um, there is a probably demand for places where uh, people can live upstairs and have some sort of making or creating space downstairs. Um, and we've acknowledged that. We've acknowledged that by actually making provisions quite flexible in the, all the centre zones. Um, and that's where I think is far more appropriate. I think, as a number of councillors have mentioned, the primary constraint behind living in an industrial area is that you can't expect to have anything else but an industrial amenity. So if someone wants to be uh, clanging at 10 o'clock at night, and that was their approval allows, you don't get to sleep until like 10 o'clock at night um, as a caretaker. But it, I think you know, trying to do this 
um, in this location is not the right spot. It's um, we do have to protect those other businesses around uh, that may be adversely affected if we all of a sudden start introducing large numbers of uh, people living on site. Hence, why I support the recommendation. Okay, Councillor Wellington, you wish to close? No, it's fine, thank you. Put the motion goes in favour. Uh, that's unanimous. Thank you. Right, we now move on to item four, Planning and Environment Court Appeal number 1802 of 2019, refusal of application for operational works for signage at Unit 1, 100 Reedy Street, Nooseville, page 35 of the Planning and Environment Committee agenda. Councillor's questions for Kerry or Kim, Councillor Yeah, a general question uh, to uh, Kim Rawlings. Um, the reason that Council is developing a local law to deal with advertising signage as opposed to our previous situation where it's partly in local laws and <coughs> partly in the planning scheme. In other words, we're taking it out of the planning scheme. The reason for that is so that it can be more prescriptive so we don't end up in this sort of situation. Is that your analysis? Yeah, that, in um, simple terms, yes, that, that is correct. At the moment, we regulate signage both through the planning scheme and a local law. Um, Council's introducing a new a new local law to have a one one stop um, shop, I guess, for for advertising signage, but also so that um, it can be um, a lot clearer and, and more prescriptive about about the requirements about signage. That's correct. Um, so, in that regard, uh, are issues. Tell, explain to me uh, the. Um, the uh, situation with regard to setting precedents now, given that we're going to be changing uh, both the planning scheme and the local law, is there a concern on your behalf that uh, we are establishing precedents in our interpretation of our planning scheme uh, in a situation such as this, uh, even though, would that have flow on effects, in other words? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not concerned about that <coughs> setting precedence here. We are we are 80% um, way through a local law, with a local law coming in in the next um, few months, which will provide um, very clear provisions around signage, including the, the size of signage. So um, things the the signage has been removed from the planning scheme. The new planning scheme's out. It doesn't regulate signage anymore. Um, so so I'm I'm not that concerned about. Um, where council might um, land on this report in terms of setting a precedence. I'm not sure if Kerry wants to add anything to that. Okay, because we're, thank you. You know, we're moving to another, a different regime. Two, two questions. Um, with regard to the frontage to Rennie Street, there is a, another block and it appears in the, 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 the imaging here that there seems to be some fencing around it. Is there... Uh, a development application, or is there a, 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 a block of land there that could be developed, which is in front of that actual sign? Uh, yes, there is a, a block of land in front of that sign, um, and it has an approval to develop. Um, so I'd expect when it does develop, and the visual analysis even recognises that that sign will be partially hidden even more. Curious. Uh, and in the original uh, development uh, application, there was uh, a signage um, uh, application uh, in, in amongst that, or site signage um, uh, design in amongst that, uh, that uh, is more in keeping with uh, the second image rather than the first image on page 37, is that correct? Uh, so that's on page 37. Oh yeah, a sign at the front and a sign at the sign as opposed to one large sign on the... Uh, that's on the, right, on the side with the original right. development application it showed two four square to meter signs. So we... Like so either way, the sign that... Uh, the, the, the signage as it stands there doesn't meet the original... That's right. Um, uh, uh, original approval on the original application by the uh, by the applicant. Thank yeah. you. Councillor Wellington. Um, yeah, I'd like to pursue the precedent issue just a little further. I don't want this to seem like an inquisition, but um, is the sign, if, if we uh, accede to uh, the staff recommendation, uh, will the sign meet the conditions in the new local laws? No. Right, no. So are we setting a precedent now by accepting a sign that is larger than what our new local laws will accept when it comes to dealing with the local laws? Because we've already said we'll accept a bigger sign. No. 
Um, under the local law, um, they are the uh, under the planning scheme. We'll start there. Under the planning scheme, the um, size requirements for signage uh, sit within a performance-based system. Um, so you, you, you know, we go through a process of um, assessing whether they it meets those requirements and and the outcomes and the visual analysis. And it becomes an interpretation of the outcomes. In some way, yes, it does. Yeah. Um, under the local law, that situation doesn't occur. The, the size requirements are prescriptive and they need to be met. If signs are proposed above them, they're prohibited. So the fact is, because we're judging this against the planning scheme, it doesn't become a precedent for our dealing with the local laws. That's that seems to be what you're saying. That's correct. Thank you. So, Council Pardon and Council Stockwell. Just a question. So how big is the sign that we're signing off on. What's your square meterage? I'm, eight I'm square really metres. Sorry? Eight square metres. Yeah, that's what I thought of read. Yeah, 8.792. Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Council Stockwell. Yeah, I was... You can like the bullet and move it. Whoa. Okay. Wow. Council Stockwell. Second. Second. Second of Councillor Pardon. Councillor Stockwell, you have the floor. Uh, this report is the reason why we've gone to local law. From a planning perspective, this is the worst 200 metres of street in the Shire for, for the signage. And the main offender achieved that result through a planning appeal process. And if that, a lot of signage got approved for appeal, we would be wasting great payers' money to take this one further. Um, I don't agree with the sign, but I understand that in the context of everything else around it, uh, which is contrary to the overarching aims that we've had for signage in this place for a long time, it's purely a contextual issue is that from a planning perspective, they will be argued that in the context of where they sit, it meets the outcome as well or better than others in this close proximity. And taking it further, I don't think will be rewarded. Question for staff. Um, I notice that the reason for um, now approving this uh, oversight sign is the visual, visual impact assessment report that was put together by the the applicant. Is this something that we that will still you know, going forward with the uh, now being local laws, which is being referred to here, that will have any more weight on on signing with regard to? Um, what, what will and won't be approved as, regard, as opposed to the, uh, the, the finite figures that we have for size signs in that uh, uh, and, and have had for some time? Um, the, the local law, um, the sizes in the local law are prescriptive, fixed. So, so, and, and, uh, you know, as per existing. Uh, we're unlikely to find ourselves in the same sort of situation going forward because it's quite clear in the local law that these are the size signs, the sizes for signs, and if they're above that, then they're prohibited. But aren't they quite clear in the in the planning scheme as it currently sits? No, they're not. They're in a performance-based system, and they're they're an app. They're okay. So that's why the visual impact outcome. assessment report has more bearing in this situation than it will not. That's right. And and um, taking from what Councillor Stockwell said, that's that's exactly why one of the reasons council is moving to regulate signage through a local law because it provides much more certainty and is and is clearer um, around um, dimensions um, and size of signs. And something like a visual impact assessment report then becomes a subjective nature depending on who writes the report, one would think. We'll take that as a comment. Thanks, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <I'm laughs> Barry. Councillor uh, <laughs> Jerusalem, I should say. Any other councillors wish to... No. That's, that's, probably, that's, probably yeah, me, that's probably me speaking to it. I think that's all that needs to be said. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I'll just re reiterate what Brian said. You're right. You know, this is not worth the drama, but I also believe it's also the industrial estate too. You know, I don't know any tourist that goes, checks into the Sofitel, then goes to a drive down Rennie Street and looks at all the signage in these areas. We, we have to have some <coughs> sort of leniency to the business down there. It's, it's a common sense approach again. Uh, it, it is great now that it's going from planning into local laws for these reasons, but I, just, I, can't, I can't get off the fact that this is still the industrial state. And if there's an area we want to do have these 
I say relaxation, it's here because it's all like you described before, it's already it set presence in the whole street. So yeah, I, I, I will, I'll be supporting it. Yeah, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I'd endorse uh, Councillor Glasgow's comments a fair bit there with regards to um, we've already had debates uh, over signage and um, uh, it's why I think way back I'd proposed that you know, we do a precinct based, if you like, uh, have a look at um, in the industrial se uh, centre as a different precinct um, with regards to size, size of signs and I'd propose probably six square metres um, rather than the four square metre signage um, that is through the rest of the Shire, CBDs, etc. Um, um, point of order, Mr Chair, okay. um, we seem to be talking about uh, a approach to the advertising uh, local laws rather than the actual application before us. Uh, well, I'm going to allow Councillor Park okay. to continue because it's, it's, it's where we're heading, it's where we're pertinent to some questions that were asked earlier in this, while we are discussing this topic, so okay. that's all right with you, Mr Mayor, I'll sure. allow Councillor yeah. Palmer. Yeah, I think continue. the local law was mentioned um, in debate here. Um, so uh, yeah, look, so um, with regards to this, it's way over six, it's eight point whatever, um, but um, given the situation where we, we are now, I'll support it. But it'll be interesting to debate on signage going forward mm -hmm. for the council. Yeah. Yeah, the council's wish to speak, council then. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm just gonna say, I don't think now's the time to debate our approach to signage across the show. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and more, more to stake a claim here and now about how we're going to approach advertising signage in the industrial area. We have that debate to come. I'm pretty certain there's going to be seven very different views around the table, and those views uh, are appropriate to make at that time, not at this time. Thank you. The talk was very careful not to. <laughs> Any councillors wish to speak to the motion before us? All right, um, Councillor Stockwell, wish to close? Put the motion, those in favour? Change, okay, so that's carried unanimously. Uh, item 5, which is the Planning and Environment Court Appeal. Right. Refusal of application for material change of use for office, restaurant and shop at 6 Cannon Street, Perugian Beach. Page 60. I'll move. Planning and Environment Committee meeting. Uh, move Councillor Wilson. That's right, We have a seconder. Yeah, I'll second Councillor Wellington. Joe, do you wish to speak to the... No, I think the report speaks for itself. I think uh, we're contrary to the planning scheme and that uh, we should be refusing this, uh, continue to refuse this application to defend the appeal. Yes. Uh, Councillor Wellington? Uh, just to say that it's appropriate to defend our decisions. That's exactly what the Council should be doing. Yes. Would the Council wish to speak to this motion? Mm. Councillor Jerusalem, no, put the motion those in favour. Against, so that's carried unanimously. Item 6, Environmental Grants Policy, page 62. <laughs> Thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Kerry. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Welcome, Craig. Okay. Yeah, Councillor Glasgow's. <coughs> Councillor's questions for Craig or Kim? Yes. Councillor Jackson. Um, Craig, I do recall that at the time we did the interim um, decision about the first round of environmental grants, mm -hmm. that we included biodiversity in waterways, wetlands and coast themes, but we didn't include sustainable living and climate change adaptation and resilience. Mm -hmm. And I noticed this new policy again does not include grants for sustainable living and climate change and adaptation and resilience. So I'm wondering if you can explain that. Yeah, certainly. Um, the intent when we originally workshopped and discussed the environment grants policy was that it would uh, provide grants to deliver the environment strategy, which has four broad areas. It has our biodiversity and waterways and wetlands, it has our sustainable living and, and climate change. Uh, but at this stage, all the funding we've allocated has been through the environment levy. Um, so all the money we're uh, going to be providing this financial year will be focused on those first two elements. 
The intent of the Environment Grants policy was to be broader than that, though. It was to enable future councils to be able to use the existing policy to be able to provide perhaps alternate sources of revenue to provide grants for those areas. That was the intent of the policy. The policy was worded poorly, the original Environment Grants policy, because there were a couple of areas where it had picked up wording directly from the Environment Levy, so it was contradictory. Um, the intent of bringing it back was just to clear that up. Um, it won't make any changes to the delivery of the multi-year environment grants this financial year. They will still only be um, for areas within the strategy that are aligned with the environment levy because that's where the funding's coming from. So that's why sustainable living and climate change adaptation are not in there. They're, they're still they're not, not aligned with the levy. They're, they're not aligned with the levy policy and for this financial year we haven't allocated funding to those areas but we may in future and this slight rewording of the grants policy will enable us to provide future funding under those. As long so as it doesn't come from the we're working on page 68, the priority funding areas may be influenced by the source of funding available, such as mm -hmm. environment, levy general rates, and other kinds of levies. That's right. So for the that's moment, important. that's correct, yes. And I also have another question. There's a sec something that's been crossed out in the mm -hmm. um, old policy. Yep. Grants will be for initiatives, capacity building, and projects that conserve or oh. improve ecosystem health. That's on page 65. Mm -hmm. um, and biodiversity in the Shire, all initiatives funded by the Environmental Grant Program will have tangible and measurable outcomes. Mm -hmm. That's all been crossed out, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering why. Oh, um, the okay. Page page. one of the policy, yeah. yeah. Okay, gotcha. So, I'm looking at the track changes version. Yep, no, that's fine. I've got that here in front of me. Um, broadly, the main reason to cross it out was for the same previous comment that the um, where it said would be for projects to conserve and improve ecosystem health and biodiversity um, for the grants policy that was considered too narrow because mm -hmm. we could potentially bring that in um, there was no specific reason to remove the tangible and measurable outcomes but they're outlined within the guidelines that sit underneath the policy um, so again that uh, there was no specific reason okay. for that to come but out there are, that is captured in the guidelines it is but that's there correct. has to be Absolutely, lost yes. The concept no, 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 absolutely not. And um, that, that wording is directly from the environment levy policy. Good so question. obviously while funding comes from the environment levy, it, they do definitely have to have very measurable outcomes. Right. Um, um, and you'll notice in the, um, the, the guideline, um, there is an area there where we ask uh, applicants to identify exactly how they're going to measure the outputs and successes <coughs> of their projects and it's allocated quite a high degree of score because we think it's important we're probably able to measure and evaluate any grants we fund. Just a further question, um, given that the environmental grants policy is one that's to be on council's website mm -hmm. and likely to be read by applicants, mm -hmm. whereas the guidelines are more likely to be read by the staff, mm -hmm. is, is there any problem with um, including that, that sentence which has been struck out, all initiatives funded by the Environmental Grants Program will have tangible and measurable outcomes. Is there any problem with leaving that in? Uh, there's not. Um, although um, the experience with the community grants, it's actually the guidelines that are read much more commonly. Um, so it's actually when we go out to the community and say, here's our grants program, it's the guideline, not the policy, that'll be the most public facing part of the document. Um, and certainly with our experience with the community grants, uh, most people don't read the community grants policy, but they very much read the guidelines. So. But if there's no harm in it, is it comfortable with it remaining? Perfectly comfortable, yeah. Good. There was no I specific reason, yeah, yeah. I'm comfortable. there's no specific reason to exclude it. So well, do we need to do something around that? If you want to make the motion, mm -hmm. what you do with the... With that change with the D. Except add that CEO, delegate to the CEO. Delegate no, to the no, CEO. That's, that's no, that's no, 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 <laughs> Need to word a D. Yeah, so what, what, you, what, you do do the what you do is at the end of A, where we're with adopting the revised environment grant policy provided attachment one, with the additional words in four initiatives. Yeah, with, the, with the following additional words to be added under the heading of council policy, under the heading of council policy, and then a colon dash. And then in these additional words, it's all initiatives funded by the Environment Grants Program will have tangible and measurable outcomes. And then put that in. Color. 
for you to move those in then, no? No, no one's moved anything yet. Well, no one's moved anything. Oh, okay. When you go to move, you move that included, if that's what the council would like. Yeah. So move, Mr. I'll second it. So move, Councillor Jerusalem, second it, Councillor Pardon. I still have a question. So oh, sorry, you have to speak. Yeah, Joe, um, you have the floor. Yeah, I think the, uh, the change's done. I think the, uh, the, this is, uh, uh, in essence, still still uh, an interim, interim move towards the ultimate uh, grants program, but uh, I welcome the changes that have been, uh, been introduced in this uh, in this grants program. Councillor Jackson, you have a question? Grants policy, sorry. Yeah, I do have a question. Um, it's relating to the guideline, mm. which I think is also here. Isn't it? No, it's multi multi year guideline. Um, back, I have a look. The conservation land guideline and the revolving fund guideline and the private land conservation guideline were all given to council to adopt mm -hmm. in previous meetings. In this case, the multi year collab sorry the yeah multi year collaborative environmental grants operating guideline is not being given to council to adopt but rather to note and i'm wondering why it's not being we're not being asked to adopt because yeah. it would seem to me that this by just being asked to note or oh, sorry that's the speak i shouldn't speak to it okay question yeah, um, the, the guideline for the multi-year collaborative environment grants is very much a public facing guideline in the same way that the guidelines for the community grants are um, and none of the community grants guidelines have been adopted by council. Mm -hmm. So this is consistent with those that because they're public facing, they'll have minor tweaks and changes every year. Um, we actually could have developed them and delivered the program without bringing it back to council at all. We just felt it was really worthwhile getting councillor input and having people across on how we were gonna, uh, I guess, roll out this program. So it's consistent with the community grants guidelines. Okay. That. I do have another question, and that is relating to the 1.2 million grant that Council has agreed to give to TNC, the Nature Conservancy. Mm -hmm. Is that in some way captured in this grant policy? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm just trying to think. Yeah, um, it, it's not different to how we addressed it when it originally came forward. I'm just trying to think of the, um, I'd have to review the actual wording on the policy. Can I take that on notice, Ingrid, and have it provided for you by Thursday evening? Would that? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Just okay. rather than sit here and read through. Um, it, it was. It formed the basis of the report that went up with regards to the, uh, to the Oyster project, but I can't recall the specific wording that we fell back on. Well, my question, though, isn't related to that. Clearly, there is a grant and it is in the agreement. That's but right, yes. My question is, does this policy, in some, because this is a grant policy, mm -hmm. is that captured in this grant policy, that sort of grant that yeah. is given? That's the question. It is, it is. It um, is but can I just, I'll, just, yes. if I, I'll, 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 I'll pull out the wording specifically for and provide it to you okay. by Thursday, if that's Thank okay. Just, just a clarifying question, are you asking is, does this policy enable mm. the granting of that mm. yes. particular grant? That is yeah. the question. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it does. Yeah. And I just need to pull out the wording. I, I've answered that question previously, but I can't recall the exact wording. It took me a while. So. Yeah. Okay. Any other councillors wish to speak to the motion? Well, well Councillor Park. Oh, just to the motion. Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, look, um, uh, this environmental grants policy, to get, to get the policy um, changes, I suppose, over time in council. Um, it's been a lot of years um, <coughs> that I've supported changes, so to give give the opportunity for the community people, members out there, uh, not only members but individuals, to apply for grants. And, and so I'm, I'm pleased to see the progress and and the way we've um, framed this policy. Or we haven't. But but I'll thank Craig and staff for framing it, um, but, but council is endorsing it. I think um, some of the, um, in the past when uh, people were uh, against, I suppose, um, taking it out of <coughs> levy, the grants and changing a policy so we could use some of the environmental levy for these um, particular projects. Um, I, I think the rigor now that it's uh, put around this uh, policy, uh, I think, is, is very good and uh, 
I think it gives um, more opportunity to actually um, enhance the, the biodiversity of Noosa Shire. And um, I thought it was a good comment from uh, Councillor Jackson too with regards to to put put that in the motion up front uh, with regards to um, tangible tangible uh, outcomes um, because uh, um, although um, it, it said it's within the document, it sort of smacks you in the face. <coughs> the and if you haven't got tangible outcomes, you know, what are we doing here? Or what, what's the community groups doing? So I think that was important as well. So um, I really think um, we can get some good future outcomes where we're getting some good outcomes. And I think out of this, um, yeah, we'll do a lot of good for the environment here. So thank you. Councillor um Stockwell. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak in favour of the, the proposal. I think this is another key step in the process of how we've reviewed where we were at the beginning of this term, and it's probably the last key deliverable from my checklist of what I think we should have achieved, so that's great. I think the best thing that will come out of this is in the name of the grant and its collaboration. And I think that's the key step that perhaps <coughs> Uh, the, the council grants haven't previously encouraged. That's about the small and large uh, environment, natural resource management, sustainability groups getting together and saying, how do we work with council or beside council to achieve an outcome through a long-term project? And I think to have meaningful impact for most of the projects I've been involved with are at least three years up on. Uh, and that will be the key change, is that we'll be funding projects that do have a increased capacity to achieve meaningful outcomes. And it's a good step forward. Okay, Councillor just to close. Nothing's all we Okay, put the motion those in favour. Against, that's carried unanimously. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Thank you, Kim. Now move on to items referred to the services and organisation committee. Uh, starting with the council meeting schedule. I'll move January the to move, Mr Chair. Uh, moved by Councillor Jurisovic. And seconded by Councillor Glasgow. I do have a question. question um, so, Joe, jo, you'll need to speak. Oh, sorry, Joe, I think Councillor Stockwell's leaving the chamber. Do you want to go to the chamber? Maybe we should have a break. Well, I'll ask we just have a momentary break while the we'll councillors have a, get some throat a, lozenges sorted. A five-minute adjournment for councillors, yeah, so that's all right. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Councillor. Cool. <laughs> oh, it's